this is Kim Bataiswanath. And if you don't know Kim, and you don't know um, the fact that she's director of Opera Nuova, and you haven't been to Opera Nuova, you're missing a lot. <laughs> because Opera Nuova, every summer for 15 years, has put on remarkable productions, summer productions with some of the hottest, most best talent in this country, without a doubt. It is the premier summer talent opera uh, expose for people coming out of opera schools and heading out into the real world to find jobs. And her dedication to this program has been unstinting, unflagging, and really quite incredible. She deserves tremendous national attention for the work that she has done. And she's here as assistant director of this fine production of Magic Flute to tell us all about characterization and some of the singers and what they go through. And in fact, just a great deal of what it's like to just put this opera on, period. I will give you a sense of this opera maybe from a, a different viewpoint, certainly the artistic viewpoint and uh, where I'm living right now. I'm very thrilled that Edmonton Opera has afforded me this opportunity to work as an assistant to Rob Harriet, who's the director of this opera. And uh, Rob and I have shared many discussions about this opera and the fact that there's, for any director having to face this opera, there is a great deal of trepidation. And it's mostly because lots of times audience members will leave the opera going, the music was fantastic, but I have no idea what just happened on that <laughs> stage. That's a very common response. So as a director, your, I mean, your first goal is always to tell a story and to impact people's lives with that story. And so to have, to know that there are many audience members that leave the opera feeling quite lost, puts a, a lot of concern in a director's heart. And so Rob has, uh, has worked very hard to say, first of all, how do we go through all of these different worlds and scenarios? Because the, the opera moves around a lot. And because of that, the designer's job is extremely difficult um, to kind of move from one world into another world into another world and to visually have an exciting impact but at the same time to create some sense of coherence of what's going on in this story. So um, Greta Gorecki, who you have seen if you've watched um, some of the operas through Edmonton Opera before, her most recent work was with Zalame and uh, that opera she had a profound effect on that opera, I felt, and ended up winning a Sterling Award for her work. And I was speaking to Greta about it today and saying, you know, Greta, what do you, you know, what do you feel is, is the hardest part of who you are as a designer for opera? Because she also does a lot of theatrical work in the city and internationally. And Greta said, in opera, people have such high expectations of what they want it to look like before they ever enter the theater. And she said, I'm not really a traditionalist, so I want to bring something new to the eyes of the audience, but at the same time, I want to be led by the music, which I think is inspiring, and I think that's what Breda did so well with Zalame, was that she lit the emotion of the music, and so you felt like you were on an emotional journey as the music came to life. She's very, very skilled at that, and I have no doubt with this set that she's created and with the lighting design that she does, that this, if nothing else, you could close your eyes for a moment, and as soon as you open up your eyes, you won't want to ever close them again, because it will be delightfully magical with regards to what they've created, the layers that they've created through cunning. And I say they, because Rob Harriet and Greta started to speak about this set design way back in the spring of last year. And of course, what you said, Joseph, was true, that they had started with the idea of Bollywood, and then they have, that's kind of been a launching pad for them. So although the costumes are somewhat inspired from that exotic world, they've moved away from it quite a bit, and Rob ended up thinking about the books that we used to read when we were children that were pop-up storybooks, where you would turn the page and you'd all of a sudden be in a new world and something new would be revealed, that's much more what the set is, is like at this point. So you will often feel like 
you're seeing one thing, and then in front of your eyes, that will be transformed into something else. Where, and we don't get to see that very often in opera. So I, I hope that that's enough of a teaser to make you go, I want to see it just from that point of view. Now I'll say that as I, I directed this opera in 2008 and had the pleasure of working with three of the artists that are actually in this production. So the fellow who you are seeing, Neil Craighead, who is playing the role of Zorastro, was my Zorastro back in 2008. He was a young emerging artist who, when I heard him sing, I thought, that man is made to sing Zorastro. And you will very much, um, but in listening to this young man's voice, you will be taken away. And one of the ladies, Jessica Muirhead, who is playing Kamina, she's done the role several times now, and she said, Neil is, she's never heard as a Rostro, who just gets up and sings with such ease. He's kind of like a very young John Fanning. So if you know John Fanning's voice, you can look to Neil and go, hmm, that's where this fellow is going for sure. There's such beauty and such ease. And he was telling me that when he did Nuova, he had done two, three different productions prior to that, always where he had played the speaker role rather than Zorastro. But he had the chance to do it in the Czech Republic. And he said in the Czech Republic, his director was a chain smoker. And uh, all through rehearsals, he would chain smoke the entire time. And while he gave notes, he would still be chain smoking. And during all the rehearsals, he would drink beer the way we would drink water. <laughs> and uh, Neil said on their very first rehearsal day, he thought, this is going to really not work. And, and what he was amazed by was the fact that this director was incredibly insightful into the piece and knew exactly what he wanted to do, and it was a brilliant production. And he loved every second of it. But he said it was, as a young artist, he kind of went, oh, look at this, is a very different world here in the Czech Republic. And one of the girls who is playing Queen of the Night, Taya Kasahara, she said, oh yeah, that, in the Czech Republic, they drink beer all the time, like water, because it's cheaper than water. So they, it's, to them, it's like, what, no problem, I'll have breakfast with a beer. So Taya has just come back from Nessen, which is right near Holland, playing Queen of the Night, and this will be her sixth performance of that role. The role of Queen of the Night is a role that many of you will know the tune, or the tunes that she sings. They're, they're some of the hardest coloratura that is written for any female voice. So when you cast a Queen of the Night, all directors are kind of like, okay, treat her very carefully, make sure she's feeling very comfortable. And, and even Rob is all the time saying, he'll say the simplest little thing to her like, do you feel comfortable bending down and picking up the knife in this moment? Because you're always worried as a director that she's going to not be able to sing and you will be responsible because of your staging. So um, it's not, Taya is very relaxed about it and is just kind of going, oh yeah, no, whatever you need me to do, I can do, it's not a problem. No, I, I'll just sing those high ups, that's totally easy to me. So she's ready to go, to say the least. Um, the thing that I think Opera Newell, not that Opera, Edmonton Opera does so well is the fact that they are bringing together a cast of singers who are quite young still. They're very much at the beginnings of their career. And yet, when I spoke to all of them, they have quite a bit of experience in these roles that they're performing for you, but they've all they all have connections, every single one of them. They would say things to me like, oh yeah, no, I worked with Neil at UBC on that show, or oh no, we were in the COC Ensemble together on that show. And so they really know one another very well. They're friends, and they've all gotten together in Edmonton, and they're totally excited to work on this terrific opera together. And you will see that on stage. And that is a, a rare kind of opportunity to see so many very confident young artists, beginning of their careers, who feel confident about what they want to share, passionate about what they want to share, and that they're totally excited 
about living this music and this story with you. For sure. So I, I kind of think that we're blessed here in Edmonton because of the fact that lots of times when you bring a seasoned performer who's done the role 25 times, they, number one, won't always be open to hearing a director say, I kind of like to do this approach. They'll go, no, 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 no. That's not the way I do. Right? That's not it. That's not the way I do this role. So all of a sudden you get in a bit of a battle. Don't see any of that going on in the rehearsal hall at all. And, and the fact that they're just a little more jaded. It's a little bit more like a job to them. I can promise you, no one that you'll be seeing on that stage feels like this is a job to them. They feel like this is a gift to them. That the, all this work they've done their whole lives is finally culminating in them being able to work and do the music that they love. So that their faces gleam with inspiration because it will be there. Tenfold, it will be there. Okay, so there's that side of it. Now I want to talk to you about Rob's take on this story a little bit. And I must admit that it's a very similar take to how I feel about the show. It's, it's about a journey. And one of the things as a director that you're trying to figure out is, what will speak to the audience? What, what does the audience need from this story? If I leave the theater after three hours, will the only thing I end up saying is, I loved the music, or I loved how visually compelling that was? Or can you get the audience to a place where they actually say, wow, that, that's really, Tamino has really, truly just been on a normal journey like our son. Don't you think that was just like our son and what he just went through in life? Because that's kind of how real we want it to be as directors. We want you to somehow relate it to life instead of feeling like it's an ethereal, Thing that has nothing to do with your lives. I don't think Mozart was writing music that way. I think Mozart was extraordinarily conscientious about wanting to draw his audience in to the humanness of the characters. So even a character like Sorostro, who is a, a Masonic brother, uh, he's a Freemason, he, we can think of him as someone who is above and beyond, but when you, when you look at the Zoroastro that's being created in this magic flute, you realize that it isn't about that. Zoroastro is a man who has gone on a journey and has grown to have a very strong spiritual belief and to have very strong virtues. And he is very dedicated to helping other men go on this journey. And he is he is uh, respectful of the fact that Pamina can actually be part of this man's journey. He is not disrespectful of that. And it's interesting because Jessica Muirhead went to Graz twice to perform this role. And she was um, directed by a Freemason, a very famous director in Graz, who was a Freemason. And I asked her, what did he have to say about your role as Pamina? And she said, he didn't want me to play it like a waif at all, or like I was somehow a subsidiary, you know, not important character, just holding the hand of being there for Tamino and Papageno. He wanted me to lead them, to be part of their journey, and to help them move forward. And he believed that Tamina's role is to show that there are women like the Queen of the Night, who become egotistical and all-powerful and wanting to be more powerful. And then there are women like Pamina, who actually, through love, wish to go on a different kind of journey in their lives. And he's showing that conflict between good and evil, right? So it's important to watch her character, because Rob, too, is really allowing Jessica to be a very strong Pamina, who is not weak. She's definitely being put in some difficult situations, but she's not a weak personality, for sure. So, you need to, um, we in the end, well, let me go back to the very, very start of the opera. When you first, when the opera first begins, Tamino comes running in, and it is, is 
running from something. Okay? And in this opera, we realize he's running from the three ladies who are approaching him. And she is, and then he ends up having to deal with this snake. And he doesn't deal with it at all. He faints, and the three ladies come along and kill the snake. So we, right off the get-go, you have to say, so who is Tamino? He's a wimp. He ends up totally fainting at the sight of this snake and not overcoming it at all. But one of the questions that Rob asked uh, Adam Luther, who was playing Tamino, very first rehearsal day was, why is Tamino even here in the first place? Right? And, and Adam had a hard time answering that question. And Rob had to kind of fill it in and help him through it. But he said, he is a prince, right? But he's chosen to leave his royal situation. And he's chosen to go seeking for who he is, right? What does he have to say in this world? And my approach, and I think Rob's approach too, is that Tamino already is setting, a, is working into his journey before he ever meets the Queen of the Night or Zarastro. He is searching for himself. He's in a situation where royalty has always meant his life is taken care of, right? He doesn't have to make decisions. If something's wrong, he asks for help and somebody comes running and helps him. So he's actually trying to escape that. He's actually searching for enlightenment about who he is. That's who we see. We see a Tamino searching for enlightenment. And then that vulnerable character becomes a target for the Queen of the Night. Because the Queen of the Night sees Tamino's vulnerability and thinks, I can manipulate him into doing what I want, which is I want Zarastro killed. And I want my daughter, Pamina, saved because she knows Zarastro has kidnapped her daughter. So there's a whole question mark about that, and I think that's why audiences have trouble following it. Because when you first see the Queen of the Night, you go, I don't know who this woman is. Where'd she come from? And when you see Zarastro, same question. You go, I don't know. Who's that guy? How do they relate? I don't get any of this, really. But so you have to kind of conjure a story for yourself. And when Jessica and I sat down and talked about it, I said, what's your story about this? And she said, I think I know Zarastro. I think my mother knows Zarastro, and possibly he's like an uncle to me. Possibly he was my father's brother. And when my father died, he, my mother thought that she would take power, but instead my father gave the power over to Zarastro. So that was her backstory that she had created. But the bottom line is that Zarastro and the Queen of the Night know one another, for sure. And Panina happens to be a situation where the uh, Zarastro has taken Pamina away from the Queen of the Night to say, you are being an evil person, and I don't believe that you can help this woman grow into a beautiful, enlightened, spiritual being. So I'm going to take her away from you. And the ego of the Queen of the Night cannot handle that, and so she sets out to kill Zarastro. That's the deal. And so Tamino becomes her manipulative puppet at first. And she, of course, like any manipulator, there's always got to be a prize at the end. And so her prize is, if you kill Zarastro, if you handle this matter, and if you save Pamina, Pamina will be yours. I will give you Pamina. And we see that what ends up happening is as soon as the Queen of the Night doesn't feel like she, she, it's working with Tamino, she then turns to Pamina and tries to manipulate Pamina and says to him, Pamina, you must kill Sarastro. And Pamina almost does it. And you'll see in this production that she turns around and realizes that she can't do it. So then the Queen of the Night goes to Monastatos and says, you must kill you must kill Zarastro. And Monastatos, who is the most evil guy and the least enlightened of everybody, even he can do it. And so the Queen of the Night decides that she's going to go after it. So you have to remember that little linkage, because then at the end of the opera, you'll realize that what Mozart's really saying is, you know, this drive for egotistical power and this sense of doing things in an evil way will not win out. In the end, only through an enlightened journey will people grow and develop and live a, a virtuous life. And I think that's an important message, even today. <laughs> I don't think that we're very far away from that message, whether or not it was created hundreds of years ago or not. I think we're on that same
same journey uh, where when if you think about how many times you've said to someone who's in a challenging situation in their life, this will be the situation that helps you the most move forward in your life. Right? What Sarastro does and what the Brotherhood does is they decide that in order for Tamino to truly grow, he must be put through trials. And that those trials will help him truly discover who he is and what he wishes to be in life. And Tamina will help him along the way as they go. So who's Papageno? See, this is the other thing. You get these new characters and go, who the heck is that character? And why do we have a bird man on stage <laughs> with this guy? But I look at Papageno is just, he's like, in many other operas, he's the buffo character. He's the fun-loving character. He's the innocence, total innocence, of just simply saying, I love life. I, I don't need to question and worry about everything, and I don't need to contemplate it all. I just love life. I love birds. I love nature. I love simplicity. Really? Isn't that enough, folks? That's Papageno. Okay? And so when you see Papageno at the end, in the, in the second act of the opera, Papageno goes to kill himself. It's a suicide aria. And we go, what on earth is going on in this opera? The, the good guy, the simpleton, the one who's loving life, is turning around and putting a noose around his neck because he's going to kill himself. Because we realize that he can't do it. Because he goes, there's just really too many lovely things to be in love with that I just can't do this horrible thing. And so he reminds us that, that yes, he goes on a journey too, but he almost starts from a more enlightened place of simplicity in the end, right? As he journeys along the side of these other characters who are dealing with much larger challenges. And in the end, he gets rewarded with love by another bird woman, right? But why, why did Mozart make him a bird man, right? In one way, it's because when Tamino, when Tamino meets Papageno, he goes, what are you? Uh, are, are you a man? Like, he, he doesn't know what to make of this person. He's certainly not royalty, but he's not even anything normal that he's ever seen before. So what does he do? He juxtaposes two very different people together to journey forward and to learn about life, simultaneously, ultimately. So I look at all of that and go, it's quite simple. It's a very simple story. And unfortunately, because you don't see them until a little ways along, you're kind of, as an opera goer, you're going, I'm kind of confused. How did this person come on the scene? But if you create a little backstory for yourself and put it in perspective in your own life of who would be Queen of the Night in your story and who would Zarastro be, that'll help you go through the journey of the story and quite enjoy what Mozart's saying. Because he is sending us a message. He is saying, folks, you know what? We all have to go through journeys if we're, and challenges if we're going to end up leading a virtuous life. I don't think he's lecturing to us at all. He's simply trying to use a very magical framework to help us explore the possibility. And then there's that question of magic. There is this question of, well, then why the magic flute? And why the magic glockenspiel? And I kind of go, because nowadays, it represents the magic that is in our lives. So we call it coincidence. Sometimes we call it serendipity, where something happens to us and we go, wow, oh, I can hardly believe that just happened. And it's like something is intervening in our lives and helping us along to understand better what we need to understand. In this case, what does Mozart do? He's an entertainer, guys. He is a composer who was made to entertain people. He wanted to entertain you, like in the movies today. They want to entertain you. So they come up with things that they go, this would be quite entertaining to an audience. This would be kind of fun. This might be interesting. And we'll let the audience figure out what it means. Right? We won't answer all the questions. So it kind of drives me crazy when people go, oh, it's, it's you know, it's all over the map, and they move from here, and they move to there, and they move to there. I'm like, excuse me, have you seen a movie nowadays? Come on, this is how that works, people. Where it's not there to give you all the answers. What is there? 
all the time, and it's certainly why Magic Flute will reign for hundreds of years as one of the very best operas, is gorgeous music. Gorgeous music. It is music that is hummable in, the, in a way. You listen to it, and it's like one hit after another hit after another hit. And it, it is music that is highly dramatic. It's quite easy to direct. You listen to the music, and you can hear the emotional changes that Mozart wants. He's, he's really a craftsman at that. And he knows because he was a very emotional guy. To, totally. To me, Mozart is like Robin Williams. Yeah, we're a very creative genius, you know, who could, you know, the way Robin Williams can spot, could spawn new characters in an impulse, new character, new idea, new, oh, I can live with that, I can work with that. That's how Mozart was with melody, right? Where he'd hear a melody in his head, and he'd go, that's, that's perfect, that's fantastic for the three ladies, and then he takes that idea and goes, oh, but, okay, there's this for the Queen of the Night. That's the genius. And in some ways, I think that's why his life had to be so short. Because it was so full of creative energy. So bombastic in a way, and full of creative energy. So much to say from such a little tiny person to the age in which he grew. And I think, yeah, a good parallel for us in this day might be Robin Williams, this genius of a creative spirit that lives today. So my only hope is that you'll leave tonight thinking and continuing to consider that opera is not an archaic art form. It's archaic if you go and listen to it like it's far and above you, like it, it's beyond you and you can't understand it. The music is there to understand. But whether they're singing in German or Italian or Swahili, quite frankly, it doesn't matter. Because the bottom line is, the story is inside the music. And the story is inside the emotion of the characters. So go to the opera, and before you go, try to kind of come up with a conjuring story, because it really could be anything, of who the Rostroy is to you, and who the Queen of the Night are, and how they relate to Pamina, who happens to be caught in the middle of it. Okay? She's being, it's like a tug of war between two divorced parents except that they're not married. <laughs> so, but they are somehow tied into one another. So that's an important part to understand. And then realize that Tamino, no matter what, is on a journey of enlightenment. And he is, he must go through these trials to actually become the man he wishes to become. So the first moment that you see Tamino, imagine that he's a young man journeying forth to try to figure out who he is. And he's got all these voices in his head about who he should be, like so many loyal people, right? Who absolutely, they have to live their life a particular way. In this case, Tamino is trying to break away from that. And therefore, the genius of Mozart puts Papageno in his path, puts the three ladies in his path, puts the, puts the beauty of a loved one that cer certainly he falls in love with Pamina. He falls in love with this woman that he doesn't even know. So I hope that helps and uh, that you, you will realize that the artists that are on stage with you that are here in Edmonton are excited to share this work with you. Uh, they're very, very talented. They are um, passionate about the art form. Uh, if you want to introduce opera to someone, this would be a great opera to introduce because people tend to love it. But go out for drinks first and, and talk about it a little bit. Okay, give it some context. Even if it's your context, it doesn't matter. Then let them experience and then go out for drinks after and chat about it. The problem with opera is that people go not having had any drinks and discussion and they leave not having any drinks and discussion. I know this because I have a husband and children who don't like the art form. But they like the art form when we chat about it first and then we talk about it later. Which is what we do when we go to a movie together. So I've decided as a family, it's the only way that I can get them to actually in indulge in the story.